Um, thank you all so much for, for coming out. Uh, so the title of the talk had previously included a specific call out to span near query. Uh, the implementation that I'm going to be talking about has, was, was done with span queries. But as I'll be uh, returning to as kind of a theme, a lot of the issues that I'm going to be discussing about are actually more general than that uh, and have to do with phrase query or proximity query in, in Lucene. Uh, I'm going to start with a brief overview of the Lucene token stream structure. Uh, the structure is what makes it possible to express the richness of indexed and queried input. Um, so Lucene's token stream API was initially assumed a, a more or less linear stream of tokens. So each token was assumed to have a position length of one, and they were assumed to progress one after another. Um, since the addition of the position length attribute in uh, Lucene 3.6, uh, it's possible to represent tokens as a branching graph that, um, that can branch and merge back together. Uh, uses of the token stream API, um, at index time, it's used to determine the tokens and token structure serialized to the index. And at query time, it's used by various query parsers to construct the, the structure of queries that are run against the index. So we have an example here of OLED manufacturing uh, which would be indexed or parsed for query purposes as organic light emitting diode manufacturing or organic LED manufacturing or um, OLED manufacturing. So talk about the latent potential of the position length attribute. It was introduced in Lucene 3.6, but position length attribute is that information is discarded at index time. It's not written into the index, and so that assumption of a linear token stream persists for indexed content. Uh, I have a nice picture of uh, braided rivers, which look cool and are basically streams that separate apart and come back together. Uh, so it's possible to do this without losing information about token adjacency in different branches. Um, so to fully leverage the structure of the token stream API at indexing time would require three things to happen, more or less in concert with each other. We would have to store the position length in the index, augment the postings API to expose position length to index readers, and update the query implementations to leverage indexed position length as exposed through the postings API. It's been pointed out that the last of these is the most challenging um, and has been a, a problem and causes problems for word delimiter graph filter used at index time, et cetera. Uh, so Lucene 7398 is the issue that forms the umbrella for a lot of what I'm talking about here. It's, the issue is nominally about nested span queries, but the issue is actually more general than that. Um, in the absence of index position length, nested span queries were the pr are, the, are the, the primary and perhaps the only way of generating or encountering variable length subclauses. So the issue that we're really talking about here is variable length subclauses and uh, query uh, phrase queries over those, proximity queries. Uh, so we're going to talk about an implementation with span near query, but the issues are more general than that. And they apply also to any phrase or proximity query implementation, as well as to the interval source API. Um, so for purposes of simplicity and generality, um, we're going to focus on the position order abstraction of the spans API. So not the entire spans API necessarily, but um, basically the, the spans API specifies that positions will be exposed in order, in increasing order by start position of a token, and then within that, a secondary sort on end position within a token. So the span positions are advanced forward only and within a given to Oh, I already said that. Ha. Uh, so we make no other assumptions. The end position might be arbitrarily larger, um, and the start position, and so we might have actually a decreasing end position 
which introduces the possibility for new matches. Uh, so, and this helps us avoid the special case, uh, avoid the, the trap of sort of considering uh, simple term spans to be a special case with a static implicit position length of one. Um, so it, this ordering happens to be a part of the spans API, but it's more generally useful because it's kind of the most sensible way to provide an absolute ordering for something that has a start position and an end position. Uh, so this is a little picture that references the previous uh, diagram of OLED manufacturing and shows how it's currently recorded in the index. Uh, so the position length is discarded, so all of the terms appear, but the adjacency relationships are lost. Um, so this can yield surprising results for um, proximity-based queries when graph token filters are applied at index time. Uh, in the example above, partially redundant synthetic phrases like OLED LED emitting diode manufacturing would perfectly match phrase queries, whereas a query for the original text in the document, OLED manufacturing, would only match with a slop greater than or equal to three. Um, and you can kind of see that because the OLED, which appears in the original document, is actually separated from manufacturing. Um, the current recommended practice of performing synonym and uh, word delimiter graph filter expansion only at query time does work around this issue, but this practice is problematic because of the importance of context in determining, um, in determining appropriate token stream manipulations. And there's a lot of context that's available at index time that is simply not available at query time. Uh, so this is also an example of a case where decreasing end position can cause matches to not be found. So match one would not be found until advancing to position D in, uh, in clause two. And then once you're at position D in clause two, you have to be able to backtrack to position C in clause, oh sorry, <laughs> zero-based indexing. <laughs> um, you have to be able to backtrack to position C when your end position decreases. So it can get, uh, it can get tricky. So as a replacement for span near query, the current implementation of the interval source API essentially has similar properties to multi-phrase query, which falls back on uh, an assumption that, sorry, falls back on enumerating all possible paths through a given query. Um, so that works in some ways, but it also introduces the potential for exponential query expansion. Which is, which is problematic, particularly if you're interested in heavily leveraging synonyms at index time. Um, so, just checking on, okay, I'm doing okay time-wise. Um, so, for the foundation for this implementation, uh, we have a wrapper that implements the SPANS inter interface, which can be wrapped around any SPANS implementation that will support backtracking efficiently without buffering any more positions than necessary. Um, so the two key method signatures that, that I'll call out here are the next match, which includes the concept of, so this is as a replacement for next, next start position, which is how you advance through spans. So this next match is basically the same thing except it includes information about a hard minimum start, a soft minimum start, a start ceiling, and a minimum end. So the idea is to basically abstract all the information that's necessary to determine whether you need to buffer positions when you advance, or whether positions can be discarded. Uh, and then the reset obviously obviously provides the, uh, the backtracking capability. So you can say, I want to go back to this start position and, and proceed from there. So you can replay positions. Uh, I think I covered these. Uh, yeah, and so the, the start ceiling um, allows you to, well, I, I won't get into those more deeply. Uh, so the, the properties of, a backtrack of the spans wrapper, uh, it's implemented as a position queue 
sorted according to the order of the positions from the backing spans. So it's a, it's a sorted queue, sorted by virtue of the fact that the input coming from spans is already sorted to conform to, um, to the position order specification of the spans API. Um, so it's linked for efficient iteration and node removal because uh, depending on the position length, some of these uh, some of these positions are going to be able to be dropped, so they 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 can be pruned out of the queue. So it's kind of a weird queue that normally would remove from um, would insert one end and, and remove from the other, but you can also take things out of the middle. Um, it's also array backed using a circular buffer. Uh, to support efficient binary seek. Because if you're going to have to be backtracking and resetting to a specific position, you want that to be fast. Um, and the array is dynamically resizable with um, the, the positions. Basically, the array index is done all the way up to uh, the maximum integer value and then rolls over by design to allow um, windows and to allow stable references to the nodes to be, um, to be preserved. So for purposes of building matches over these subclause, um, each subclause has its own queue of positions. That's what we talked about in the last slide. Um, Nodes in those queues are also linked laterally across subclasses, subclasses to build matches without duplicating information about the positions. So you already have the information stored. You just want the nodes in the queue to do sort of double duty, both within its position, but also across positions to build the matches. Um, so you have kind of like a two-dimensional queue in a way. Uh, yeah, so maintains references to the previous and next nodes within slop constraints. And we mentioned the stable node references that are um, wrapped around and, and that don't just use the index position in the backing array. Um, so the resulting word lattice that you end up with is built using the next match uh, method signature that, um, that was referred to in one of the previous slides. And so calling next match as part of the, the algorithm for, for building the matches drives a depth first search to discover and build and cache the edges in the dynamic graph represented by valid nodes at a point in time. Um, so it's a dynamic graph in the sense that uh, progressing in different ways can cause certain nodes to become invalidated. So you can kind of uh, prune them out and close the gaps up. Um, so, and the phrase paths that are already explored are cached, enabling match tree traversal to be short circuited, and you have a downstream postfix subtree grafted onto upstream match prefixes. Um, you can see that happening here a little bit. So you can see um, the links from B prime to B double prime and C double prime have been explored from starting from uh, position A, but then those links from B prime to the, uh, to the third subclause are still going to be valid, and we know they're going to be valid at B. So you don't have to re-explore those. Um, and it's a little bit tricky to, <laughs> to explain what's going on here. I had a very hard time uh, coming up with a good example. Um, but what's going on here is that C prime, D prime, E prime, and F prime are all much closer to position C. So you have links going to all of those. So you can note the the fan out, the, the potential for fan out, and also the sort of strange interactions of um, slop, because as you move to different positions, you are also consuming slop and are therefore left with less slop available to continue building the tree out to the, to the right. Uh, 
Right, so this is a linked approach. A lot of the data structures in Lucene are array-based because they're very fast and they generate little garbage collection. Uh, if we're using a linked approach, which is kind of necessary for this uh, two-dimensional situation where nodes can get yanked out um, and we want positions to close up, there's, the, there's lots of small transient objects, um, including just, not just the storage nodes, but also the linking nodes that allow us to build all these links. Um, so there's lots of garbage collection, potentially. Uh, so implementing a, a queue for the nodes and the linking nodes it resulted in two times to 10 times better performance uh, in comparison to an implementation with object pooling disabled. Um, and the, the variation there is in keeping with the intermittent nature of long garbage collection related pauses. So uh, that was uh, made a big difference. Uh, so the query implementation finally gives us a, a really solid reason to implement as opposed to ignore indexed position length. Uh, for purposes of development, testing, and initial deployment, most of the extra information that was needed was implemented with payloads. Um, and the encoding of the payloads was uh, accomplished by a, um, a token filter that sits at the end, sort of like the flattened graph filter, but it reorders tokens to conform to the ordering specified by the spans API. So at query time, they're just read out in, in a normal order. Uh, I'd be interested to see what the performance impact would be of uh, using a position length implementation that isn't based on payloads. Uh, I have a sense that it would probably be faster, but um, yeah, to, to be done. Uh, there's also some other information that is useful. Uh, start position look ahead. So we're buffering all these positions, but there are um, certain uh, efficiencies that can be gained if you're able to sort of look ahead to the ne what the next start position would be. Um, so uh, if you do that, then it's possible to, um, to avoid buffering entirely for the normal use case. Because most people's data doesn't have this kind of rich structure, but you can use the same approach and it just won't buffer if it doesn't need to buffer. Um, so there's some edge cases here. Uh, you can also make some efficiencies if you know that the end position will never decrease across positions, almost always it doesn't, but for some cases it, it might do so a lot of the time. Uh, and if the assumption about the position length being one always is valid, then you can take advantage of that as well. Uh, this is currently implemented with four bytes that are pre-allocated in the payload um, and sort of modified after the fact by the default indexing chain. Um, there's probably a better way to do that. <laughs> but, but for a proof of concept, this yielded uh, excellent results. So uh, one last thing is common words. How many minutes do I have left? Two? OK. Um, so common words are a problem for phrases. Uh, you can uh, use a stop word filter, which leaves holes, which behave weirdly for for the words that you're removing from the index or from the queries, or you can use common grams filter, but that makes it so that any word that is included in your common gram has to always be included exactly next to the um, to its paired uh, term. So. Um, we're able to work around this by basically pre-filtering the uh, conjunction spans, and uh, that worked nicely. I can talk more about the details of that if, if people are interested afterwards. There are different match modes, because now that the matching is much more precise, we can do things like greedy matching and uh, per position matching and per end position that basically ensure that um, nested subclauses uh, expose every valid end position so that we're certain to match everything that needs to be matched. 
Um, so I'm particularly interested in CJK indexing, uh, anything that has multi-token orthographic variants, uh, word delimiter graph filter. This also opens up the possibility for creative uses of n-grams and shingles that would behave more predictably. Um, and yeah, more nuanced scoring. Also potential non-text -u non use cases. So uh, anything that could be represented as an ordered stream of discrete, possibly overlapping elements, each having a start position and an end position. I could see this being useful. Uh, obvious um, case would be time series data, like travel scheduling, where you could um, represent individual trips as tokens. Um, could be pretty fun to mess around with that. I have not done that, but somebody should. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, some links, and thank, yeah, thank you.